Amen. Let's stand to our feet and let's pray over the Word of God. How many of you are excited about the Word of God? Yeah, how many of you need a word from the Lord? Amen. I want you to stand in great expectation. Hallelujah. To have an operating expectation that something great is going to happen. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. I love you for who you are. I appreciate you for your presence because in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore God we are not here by happenstance or circumstance we are here by your divine providence for you have ordered our steps whether it be via an invitation or a, no or a notion or it's just our home church to worship we are here on purpose and this is not a wasted moment, but it's a sheer experience in the glory of God. Spirit of the living God, have your way in this place. I thank you for what you're doing. I believe that something wonderful will take place in these next few moments that we are together. Because I do know that one word from you can change an entire situation. Because the word of God is more than literature. The word of God is life. It's helping healing to our bodies. And Father, I thank you for your word. Now, Father, I ask you to touch my neighbor to the left and to the right of me. And if I have one behind me, touch them too, Lord, as well as the one in front of me. Because this is a sacred moment that you want to minister to the entire being of who we are. We have nothing that will cause us to miss the God moment that we've been sent here for today. Spirit of the living God, have your way in this place. My Father, I ask you to give me the mind of the wise and the tongue of the learned. When you say stop, I'll quit. When you say yield, I'll slow down. And everything is for your glory. In Jesus' name, all God's people said amen. Let's confess over the word of God. If you have your Bible or your regular phone or your mobile device, just repeat after me. Say, I believe absolutely everything that this book says about my life, my family, my future, my finances, my feelings, and my faith in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I'm, I'm loving seeing the regular Bibles once again. I see a few more out there, so... It's good to have that word that you can pick up and look at. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Uh, I'm going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. And I'm going to go to verses 1 through 8. Chapter 30 verses 1 through 8. Uh, and I'm coming from the Amplified Version. Uh, one of the reasons that um, I am parking here is because if you, man listen if y'all if y'all keep missing these Wednesday nights Wednesday nights ain't no throw off amen I'm telling you it is it is it is something to be a part of uh as you walk with God we we just we're just man uh, uh because we, we talked a little bit about uh living the faith directed life Amen. And there is a juxtaposition there within that teaching that juxtaposes faith and optimism. Both are very similar on the surface, but the difference is where their anchor lies. And um, go back and watch it. It should be on the app or something like that. I don't have time to get in that today. But um, and I also I don't know why the Lord has put this on my heart, but I'll say this again this today before we get into this, that the growth of any godly work. Is in the believer's mouth. Oftentimes I say this Wednesday night, I'll say it again. Uh, people tend to put a lot of pressure on the preacher to grow the church. I've met some preachers that can preach Jesus like he getting up out the grave.
can preach paint off walls, but have three or four people to come to their church. Because if you look at scripture and you look at the growth principle in the Bible, it doesn't come from preaching by itself. So when people say, just preach Christ and they'll come, that is not theologically sound. Even Jesus or his preaching was not enough. The people who heard it went back and shared it and then you begin to see the masses assemble amen so when you just come just preach jesus bishop they'll show up no they won't because paul says we are living epistles you're the bible that they need to read to come hear about the god that you talk about amen so I just want to share that with you and, and, and continue to pray and continue to mobilize, but also continue to share your faith audibly. Amen. 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 Hallelujah to God. First Samuel 30 verses one through eight in the Amplified says, now when David and his men came home to Ziklag on the third day, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid on the south, the Negev, on and on Ziklag, and had struck Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken the women and all who were there, both great and small, captive. They didn't kill anyone, but carried them off and went on their way. So David and his men came to the town and behold, it was burned and their wives and sons and daughters were taken captive. Then David and the men with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. Now that is a piece of crying. Until you can't cry anymore. Watch this. Dave, Dave, King, King David, King David, the leader, his two wives also had been taken captive. So he was not inoculated from what had happened. Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. David also was greatly distressed. But watch this. For the men spoke of stoning him because the souls of them all were bitterly grieved, each man for his sons and daughters. But David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David said to Abathar the priest, Amalek's son, I pray you, bring me the ephod. And Abathar brought him the ephod. If you understand what the ephod is, I will explain it to you. But it's a priestly garment. Amen. And, and that's why we need to understand that there is a uniform to the preacher. There's a uniform to the ministry. It has significant meaning. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? The Lord answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail, recover all. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Uh, without fail, you shall pursue all. Uh, without fail, you shall pursue and recover all. Without fail, you shall go and recover all. <laughs> wow. Tell your neighbor, it's a neighbor. The Lord is going to speak to our hearts today. So I, I need you to find a neighbor that will talk with you and find a neighbor that will talk to you and not a t neighbor that won't say anything around you because your neighbor's voice is uh, tied to your, your next move. And say, neighbor... I need you to help me move. 
Yeah, so so I need you to help me move. And so we can't stay stagnant. We can't stay still. We have to open up our mouth and bless the Lord. Amen. There is a major difference. Watch this. In feeling defeated. Versus the reality of being defeated. Major difference. Major difference in feeling defeated. Versus the reality of being defeated. Paul's here. By the show of hands, has anybody ever lost anything in life? Show of hands. It's a major difference in the feeling versus the reality of being defeated. Because the feeling of defeat tends to draw from the source of the possibility of defeat. But it hasn't actually happened yet. That's kind of the feel. You know, you can feel something, but it ain't not really, hadn't really quite happened. But you think it may happen, and that does not negate that the feeling exists, even though you haven't been defeated yet. But you feel like you may end up being defeated. Right. But the reality of defeat is actual lived experiences that is in no way theoretical, but it's empirical. I actually went through this. I actually lost. Yeah, I, I lost something. This is real. I have the experience and the data and the facts to prove that I actually went through this. So this defeat is absolutely real. I'm not just talking about something that might happen. This did happen. Amen. Lost by its very nature is challenging. Nobody wants to lose anything. Amen. So lost by its very nature is challenging. It's not easy. But when loss is unexpected, whew, the challenge is significantly amplified. When you lose something of significant value and or meaning, when you lose it unexpectedly, if not careful, for a moment, it could cause a temporary separation of personal belief, convictions, boundaries, and value. Let me read it again. When you lose something of significance or meaning unexpectedly, if you're not careful for a moment, it could cause you temporary separation of personal belief, convictions, boundaries, and value. Y'all don't know what that, you're looking at me confused, but here it is. Best thing I can use is if somebody dies in your family unexpectedly, that's very close. You notice how you don't answer your phone, you don't talk to nobody, you get lost, you isolate, you go away. But that wasn't you prior to the experience. You was happy-go-lucky, you'd be glad to talk, all that kind of stuff. Because of the unexpectedness of it, it hurt, it was tragic. You were not even thinking that because the brain... Is not wired to be surprised. So you shut down. Spirit filled ain't talking. Anointed, but separated. Praising, praiser, but quiet. None of us is inoculated from what I just mentioned. I don't care how anointed you are. Amen. But, but you got to be conscious of it. They, they call this emotional intelligence. You have to know how you respond, mostly in certain situations. Yes. And if you know that you have the proclivity not to respond in a positive way or manner that's, uh, that's becoming to you as a person or a man or woman of God, it's best for you to recuse yourself from such or said circumstances. Amen? <laughs> and so when you are temporarily disconnected from personal belief and values, this can lead to irrational thinking as well as irrational behavior. 
You ever notice when somebody's like, they, they you know, so, uh, I've heard people's stories tell like when their mom or father passed away, they lost somebody close or a spouse or something like that, they started drinking. You know, uh, 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 you know, getting 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 hooked on prescribed medications and and doing stuff that they didn't have that they, they didn't have any business doing because they 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 just because them now they're disconnected from personal belief, they're disconnected from their convictions, they disconnected from their values and their boundaries because of because of loss. Yes. Uh, it, loss is at the root of this irrational thinking and this irrational behavior. Amen. Whew, Lord have mercy. Are y'all with me? But this is also the moment where even the most encouraging words tend to fall on deaf ears. If you lose something, in that moment, you probably don't want to hear anything. Or you probably tried to encourage a person who lost something. They don't want to hear nothing you have to say. Because what you have to say is not bringing back what they lost. And so I, I don't care how many scriptures you know, how many prayers you want to pray, how many times you say in the name of Jesus, they don't want to hear none of that. It's falling on deaf ears. But it's also a time where presence is extremely beneficial. When there are no words that can provide comfort and solace, Paul quotes the psalmist in Acts, I mean, in Acts 2, 28. He quotes the psalmist, I believe Psalm 16. He says, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. You have made known to me the path of life so you know you knew before I experienced this what I would go through and you were just waiting for me to acknowledge your presence in this and when I did your joy filled my life Whew, God help me so today, I want to talk to somebody online in this room. If you're dealing with loss in any form, I want you to take comfort in knowing that God's presence is greater than the pain. Yes, sir. If you're dealing with loss in any form, I need for you to know this, that God's presence is greater than the pain. And also that the power of the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to successfully navigate. And this is what I want to talk about today. Between rocks and recovery. The Holy Ghost gives us the ability to navigate when we're between rocks and recovery. How many people, I'm, I'm just quit, just a rhetorical question, says, uh, believe that you're faithful? Show of hands. You're faithful. Mm. You know, uh, James chapter 1, I believe, says, count it all joy when you fall into different types of temptation knowing that the trying of your faith produces steadfastness and endurance and you know and patience so that you can be fully developed lacking in absolutely nothing when I asked that question it, I kind of set you up a little bit most of us are faithful when things are well. It's easy to be faithful when things are well. Faithfulness is easy when decisions are not required. Let me say that again. Faithfulness is easy 
when decisions are not required. Who, I, I, I can't tell you almost a 21 years of pastoring how many times that we've heard, uh, uh, my wife and I, that God has sent a person here. They've said out of their own mouth, unprovoked, unrehearsed, God has sent me here. Uh, I believe the Lord has made this place my refuge in my home church. I, I, the Lord has done this. And, and, and as soon as they said, I mean, it's good to say it when things are good. But the Lord does speak in storms as well as peace. See, 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 oh, Lord have mercy. Uh, uh, it's, we can easily say God sent me here when, when it feels good. But it's ended amazing how God's voice matches our feelings. You didn't hear that, did you? I said, isn't it amazing how God's voice matches our feelings? When we feel like we want to be here, it's God. When we feel like we don't want to be it's, not, it's still God, but God has ended the season. It's over. It's, it's time to move. And it's always amazing that uh, how our feelings matches God's voice. But I'm trying to tell you, walking by faith, feelings very seldom match what God says. God says, stay, you want to go. God says, God says, go, you want to stay. God says, give, you want to keep. God says, keep, you want to give. Yeah. But watch, watch now, watch, watch this, watch, watch. Mm. Huh, I, I got a wonderful church. I got a church full of families. Amen. Little ones and big ones and medium-sized ones, you know. It's, everybody say family. And I see the families, you know, rocking babies to sleep and giving them animal crackers and, and trying to give them something to keep them quiet during the service. And, you know, just everybody say families. And, you know, and, and the families also have a, a, a other interesting dynamics, you know, because outside of the church, you know, if you got kids of grade school age, they're, they're doing things. They're at award banquets. They're going to assemblies. They're, they're in sports. And, you know, they travel and Girl Scout cookies and, and, and Boy Scout trips and Cub Scout trips. I don't know if they still have all that kind of stuff. But anyway, you know, they, they, they play AAU, BUU, -U, CUU, -U, any tournament they can find. They are in all them tournaments and they just every weekend, you are, you, I mean, something is going on with the family. You know, if you got, a, you know, your business as a woman, business as a man, something's going on with the family. And so you just find it where, oh, I, I can put God in the middle of all of what I have going on. And I'm I'm still faithful to the church of God. Amen. But one can be faithful and fulfilled until, I mean, they can be faithful and fulfilled in following until, everybody say until, until following affects the family. Uh oh. Ooh, stay with me. We can be faithful and fulfilled in following until following affects the house. Now, all of a sudden, we got to try to do what didn't exist before, balance. You got me? And I try to teach people this. You remember, it was the faithfulness that got you to family. Something in my eye, Mike, I, you know, something shot back at me, so it hit, came through the glasses, closed my eye, and I'm, oh, open it back up, okay. All right. And I'm all about family. I love family. You know, faith, family, and finances, that's our, that's our, that's our trinity here at Power Nation. I love family. But I want to help you with something. I want to show you something. I want to tell you a truth that you don't want to hear, but we need to hear. Watch this. David is king. In 1 Samuel 3rd, he is king, and, and he's leading the men of God in successful battles. 
He's doing, this is the same young little lad that killed a giant when nobody, nobody, no, nobody would fight. And not only would they not fight, they were scared. In his teenage years as youth, he's fighting other people's giant and killing them. He's dodging the javelin of Saul. <laughs> because Saul is jealous because they've made a song about David. He's killing 10,000, Saul is thousands. And the Bible said from that day forward, uh, Saul eyed David, looking for opportunities to take him out. And all of that happened. He's, he, has a, he has a threefold anointing. He's anointed from his family. He's anointed in front of the, the city. Now he's anointed in front of you know, the nation. So he's, he, he's, he's the man now. He, he's king and he's leading well. He's leading excellent. And watch this. And now he's away from Ziklag because he's on his way home. But while he's away, the Amalekites take advantage of his absence, come in and burn Ziklag south of the Negev, and not only burned uh, their property and their, their houses and their tents, but they also took, watch this, they took their family, oh took their wife, took their sons, and took their daughters. And watch this. And David gets home, back home, he is not left out. Both of his wives are gone. David, just like the people he's leading, is hurting too. Is suffering too. But somehow or another, when they experience loss, they temporarily become disconnected from their beliefs their convictions, their values, and their boundaries. Right now, they don't care how good David has been. He don't care how good of a king that he's led them into victory after victory. He don't care what type of counsel that he's given them. He don't care what type of land that they've conquered. The only thing they know, because I've been following you, my family has been affected. If I wouldn't have been with you, David, and been at home, my house would have been protected. If I wouldn't have been with you, David, and been at home, my marriage would have been in a better place. If I wouldn't have been at church with you, David, and been at home, I would be there and be a balanced mom and a balanced dad. If I wouldn't have been volunteering with you, David, and been to the house, I could have, my marriage would be in a better place. If I would have been, if I wouldn't have been with you, David, out there while you're on the road preaching and been at home, I would be in a whole lot better circumstance but you forget that David counseled you you forget that David helped your kids you forget that David wrote reference letters you forget that David was there when nobody else understood you forget that David helped you through a rock and a hard place where everybody told you it would fail because right now you suffered loss and the closest one to blame is the leader is the leader. They are so disconnected from their values and their beliefs and their convictions. They want to kill David. Do you see how far gone loss will lead you? <laughs> they are gone. Because now, oh, now watch this. Now these are soldiers. They said, we don't want to kill him with a sword. We want to stone him. Stone him. Stoning is a suffering death. Oh, I, I, I just don't want to kill him quickly. But I want my leader to suffer. Because I want him to suffer like he's making me suffer. Because if I'd have been here, I could have protected my wife and protected my son and protected my daughter. But I'm out there following you. Whew, wait a minute. Did you just tell me the other day I was your king? Oh. But the interesting thing here is there was no loss. 
loss can make you change your mind based on how you feel. Amen? Hallelujah. That's why, let me tell you something, as a disciple, when you choose to say yes to follow, that means that, I need to help you here, that means that no matter what comes up in life, it does not override your yes to God. Uh, um, Fallon, hey, I'm not picking on you. I got two. I forgot. I got two. My nurse Fallon back there. Um, you went to nursing school, right? Um, you couldn't miss but very little time. Is that correct? So uh, if you had the flu, you had to get over very quickly, didn't you? If you had a cold, you had to get over very quickly, didn't you? Uh, even if uh, you were pregnant, you, you couldn't stay out 16 weeks and, 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 and spend time with the doula going through Walmart, picking out natural formula and all that kind of stuff and, and picking out, you know, uh, uh, nipples that, you know, more natural and don't have cellophane and stuff on it because, you know, you couldn't, couldn't walk, couldn't spend time with the doula, could you? Because you had said yes to a program that was very strenuous. Watch this. And why is it so strenuous? Because I've chosen, a, I've strode, not, not just competitive, I've chosen a profession that a person's life is literally in my hands. Now that's just a nurse. But when you give your life to God and you say, yes, that I'm going to serve the Lord, you're saying when God puts something on you, he's really saying, hey, literally, that somebody's life is hanging in the balance of your yes. Lord, help me. Oh, God. And so the reason why I just told my I admin, this, uh, not my admin, I told somebody this today, uh, um, this morning that people somehow put church and God in a whole different arena outside of normal living. It's like the church has no standards. You know, you we can just come do what we want to do, just show up and we you know, uh, we you know, you got folk that don't come to service but want to serve. You know, don't just I just show up the day I serve. Hold on, we do have core values here. You, you, we have standards. Don't you don't watch these lights. Uh, 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 we just had the lights, you know, something done with the lights. Uh, uh, was that free? Did we, uh, we had to pay for that. I, I, people don't come and fix stuff. Talking about, well, y'all the church. Don't even worry about it. Matter of fact, it's the exact opposite. Who the church got money? Boy, they, boy them, them vendors, the ice turn into dollar signs like cartoons. Y'all, did did, did y'all know the church has to do everything a, a, a for-profit business has to do? We, we got to pay staff. We, we, we got to pay insurance. You know, we got to, you know, all that stuff. But some reason people don't think the church has to do that. It's all about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. But the government don't know that. Uh -oh. Uncle Sam don't know that. Amen. Amen. Things do, so, so watch this. It's, it's like, you know, I, I join, that's why I tell people when you join a church, any church, not just Power Nation, don't just say, oh, I'm a member. No, don't do that. Because what you're saying is you're saying, I'm putting my life under the covering of the under shepherd, which is the pastor of the house, who's his chief shepherd is Jesus. And so when I join the church, they're expecting me to help with the lives of the people who come in the church. And so, and so when you join the church, the local church, whatever church that is, your theme song becomes, my life is not my own. To him I belong, I give myself, I give myself to you. Because that's what discipleship is. Yeah. Discipleship hadn't changed. Read the Bible yes. of what a disciple is. Mathetes, Mathetes, or Mathetes, or what you want to say. That's the Greek word for it. It means one who seeks to learn. Yes. Amen? Yes. And we come up with all these reasons of why we can't anymore. Especially when it comes down to the family as if God got grace for you as a single person but not grace as you as a mama or married or dad as a father say God has grace for all of me and say God has grace for every role amen hallelujah to God watch this when they suffered loss, man, they, they, they spoke of stoning David because, nah, this, 
hold up, this, this ministry thing you're talking about done affected my house. Oh, we, we're going we, we to re, revisit this. Amen? Now listen, you might not have gotten to the point where you just feel like you want to stone the preacher or the pastor. Maybe you have, I don't know. But uh, you have gotten to the point where you know what? And I've heard it. I ain't going to tell you, but I, I tell you, I've been in church 21 years, man, pastor. So I've heard it. I've heard the husband tell the wife, you spend too much time at that church. I've heard the wife tell the husband, you spend too much time at that church. I've heard non-church people tell churchgoers, you over there at that church all the time. I've, I've, I've heard that and, and hear people say that. And, and, and if you're not careful, you know, when, when, if you keep letting those conversations play, when laws show up, it's more easy to be disconnected. Yes, that's good. Amen? Amen? Y'all ready? Amen. Didn't I tell y'all that leading went through the same thing? Yes. Lord have mercy. David experienced the same fate as the rest of them. But they didn't extend grace to David like David extended grace to them. David did not turn to them and say, I ought to kill all of y'all. Because we could have marched faster. We could have got here quicker. My house was affected just like them. Now, no, David didn't turn on them and look at them and blame them. But, 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 but yet they blamed David. Isn't it amazing that, watch this, that the followers don't give the same grace to the leader that the leader gives grace to the followers? Isn't that something? It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's right here in the text. And so now David is in the midst of a leadership dilemma. He finds himself in the midst of a challenging dichotomy. It's very challenging. While he is suffering from his own frustration and loss, he must lead with faith and confidence. Oh, I know it looks like Bishop has it all together when I stand on this stage and I look through these glasses and the, and the lights are shining and the camera is on me and the mic is in my hand and you're there listening as if I have it all together, as if I cross every T and dotted every I, as if I never get tired, as if I never get frustrated, as if I never want to let people alone by themselves. But I cannot allow the losses of my life to affect life itself. Y'all, Y'all not hearing what I'm saying. And so what I have to do is I have to tap into a deeper relationship that goes deeper than what I feel. I have to go into where God lives and that's the spirit of God because the spirit of God is the candle of a man's soul. And so some of us, you know, everybody, we talked the other day, and everybody got something going on. You know what? one. You ain't the only one. Everybody got something going on. And you know what? You got the same 24 hours I get. The same Monday the Lord wills tomorrow will be the same Monday you get. The only difference between our, my Monday and your Monday is the decisions you make. Is the decision because time is fixed. Energy is flexible. And so, watch this. If you knew Sunday was coming, you knew your worship to God was coming, what did you do last night that would rob you of your energy to put all of your attention on God's word, to give all the praise this morning when you woke up, to step into the house of the Lord and say, I will bless the Lord at all times. You know it was coming after three o'clock so I can go to bed early, so I can wake up with God's praise on my lips and show up and be a praiser. You will have any excuse this morning. It was all on you. Oh, that's the truth. All on you. I know you got businesses. You started it. And when you started it, you set the schedule. Hello? I love Chick-fil-A. And Chick-fil-A probably love money. How many Chick-fil-A's open today? When last time you seen a Chick-fil-A open on Sunday? But Monday through Saturday? That, thank God for the one back, open back up in Winterville. I ain't, I ain't been though, but I, I've seen it. That, them double lines. 
It was raining the other day. And they ain't even got the shelter up over the and, and I saw them running the bags out to the I was just I was sitting there and I said, God, look, will you look? Them folk running chicken in the rain. Hold on, wait a minute. They running chicken. Oh, wait a minute. Did, did, did you hear what I just said? Rasai, you hear what I just said? They running chicken. In the rain. And we won't even come to church if it's raining. So you trying to tell me chicken is better than Christ? I knew they weren't going to hear this, Lord. You told me to say it. David is being blamed, but he's not mad with them like, like they mad with him. And so, watch this. Now, everybody mad with him because the Bible didn't say nobody. He didn't say his first lieutenant. He didn't say his captain. He didn't say his sergeant. Everybody want to kill him, which makes David alone. What do you do when your entire camp is burned and everybody who you thought was with you now want to kill you? Ain't no... Lord have mercy. This, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is serious. Not one of his followers came to say, Pastor, don't even worry about it. We're going to get them back. It's going to be all right. I'm with you. Not one. Everybody wanted to stone him. But David said, you know what? When my mother and my father forsake me, I know then the Lord will take me up. I believe David probably had a flashback when nobody would fight Goliath. So when nobody would come to see about him tending the father's sheep on the backside of the mountain, there was nobody there to kill the bear but David. There was nobody there to kill the lion but David. And so I believe David probably went somewhere into the chambers of his mind and recall those times that when things tried to kill him and he was by himself, this moment ain't no different than that. Well, what did David do in this moment? The Bible says that David, because he didn't have a praise team, he did not have a prayer partner, he did not have a choir, he did not have a congregation. When he was on the back side of the mountain, it might got lonely back there sometimes, but the Bible said David encouraged himself in the Lord. What am I trying to tell you? Stop waiting for a phone call for somebody to say that you've done a good job. Stop waiting for a line for somebody to prophesy to you. Stop waiting for somebody to give you an award. Stop waiting for somebody to give you an accolade. Stop waiting for an applause because of your good deed. If they never say good job, if they never come to shake your hand, if they never give you an award, you got to learn to pat yourself on the back and say you are bad somebody and if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I would not be here. And I need you to practice right now and give God a praise for you just being here. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now, I thought that would go a little bit better than that because I know by, by the looks of this crowd that you ain't always had the support that you really wanted, but you still made it anyhow. You didn't have the money that you needed, but you still made it anyhow. You didn't have people around you that you wanted around you, but you still made it anyhow. When you high five your neighbor, I made it. I was by myself, but I made it. I had tears in my eyes, but I made it. My heart was hurting, but but I made it. Look at the master. I made it. Look at the master. I made it. It was nobody but the Lord on my side. And that's all I needed. Somebody shout and say, I made it. Yeah. 
Don't sit here now and act like you always had everything you needed. Sitting right cute and pious and pompous. But when you were struggling, when the, when the light was on, when you had them a dollar and 50 cents and couldn't afford a gallon of gas, and you were just hoping that you can make it from the job back to the house, when you open the cabinet, that one number of oodles and noodles and a half a box of bacon soda in the refrigerator, but yet you made it. Don't you get bougie on us now because you can eat steak. You got to remember when God did some things for you. Watch this. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, I owe God a praise in the yeah yeah how soon we forget how soon we forget how soon we forget hallelujah glory to God looking at these single parents dads and moms you sitting there struggling trying to put that baby in the car seat you could you didn't have a baby shower somebody gave you a hand me down glory to God with the seat belt the baby getting big and you can't afford a new one but somehow or another God made a way for you and your baby to make it the way you may I need some real saints in here this morning amen hallelujah Truth be told, watch this. If we in church, everybody in here done been through something. Look, look at it. I don't care how cute they are. I don't care how good they smell. The person sitting next to you in front of them been through something. Or they're going through something right now. And that's not to say that you're a bad person because you went through something. Because watch this. Now we know that we had enough sense that what I went through, I wouldn't have made it if it weren't for the Lord. Hallelujah. And since the Lord allowed me to make it, I made a decision to give my life to him. And for God, I live. And for God, I will die. If that's your confession, shout glory in this church. So David encouraged himself. Sometimes you need to get off social media and just encourage yourself. Hallelujah to God. If it ain't a new car, at least you got a car. Say, I'm doing a good job. If it's not a brand new living room set, thank God you got a set. I'm doing a good job. Hallelujah. If it's not a brand new dinette set, it's thank God you got somewhere to eat. Say, I'm doing a good job. If you got to pull out them TV tables, if you got to watch your little 32-inch color flat screen, it's okay. Say, I'm doing a good job. It ain't got to be 85 inches. You ain't got to have a Maybach sitting in the drive way. You ain't got to have five, five bedrooms and three bathrooms. Look at somebody say, I'm doing a good job. job. Learn to encourage yourself. Stop talking about what I don't have and what they got because I don't know. Encourage yourself. Watch this. But I don't want to stop with just encouragement. David encouraged himself to do what? Get in the presence of God. Some of y'all trying to encourage yourself to go back and do it. But I'm trying to encourage you to get into the presence of God. Oh, wait a minute. David encouraged himself to so much so he said, you know what? Uh, Abathar the priest, can you bring me the ephod? The ephod is, 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 is a priestly garment. It's, it's, it's a breastplate. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's placed over to protect the chest, yeah. the vital organs. And, and this was very significant because it has two sacred stones in the breastplate called the Urim and the Thummim. And what that represents, it represents the will or the counsel of God. And so David said, you know what? Since I don't have any good counsel out here amongst these people who want to stone me, I know who will give me counsel. Good God Almighty. Well, you need to know the right one to talk to when you're going through. Uh, you, you don't need to talk. you going through and you talk to somebody that's going through. I know how you feel. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I don't need to hear that. I need to hear something that's going to get me out of the quagmire of where I am and going to put me in the pursuit of where God needs me to be. Tell your neighbor, say, you better talk to the right one. Yeah. You ever talk to somebody when you finished talking to them you felt worse? So I came to you for help. And I feel worse. I think that's the wrong one. <laughs> wrong one. David says, bring me the, the ephod. Because I need to talk to God because ain't nobody talking right around me. 
whenever it seems like you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Anybody ever been there? Caught between a rock? That, that means I don't see any way out of this. Uh, if you're ever there, or been there, or find yourself there in the future, there's always an open channel to God. Let me say that. When you seem like there's no way, there was always an open channel to God. The Bible says in verse 8 that David inquired of the Lord and asked God, what should my next step be? <laughs> oh, Lord. When everybody P.O.'d, uh -oh. David talking to God. <laughs> now watch this. You can be P.O.'d where you are and lament in it. You can keep picking up the ashes and let them seep through your hands. Am I what used to be? Ooh, didn't we have a good time back in the day here? Oh, it was so wonderful back in the day before this happened. Uh, you can lament. Some people, watch this, they stop living and start lamenting. You, 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 watch this. You, 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 you build a living memorial to where it died. And you can't see life beyond where it died. Good God Almighty. But David says, I'm going to go into the presence of God because his presence fills my soul with joy. Lord, they came here after I and the men were gone. You've seen what had happened. Now watch this. You got to understand that King Saul, the one who was king before David, went through the exact same thing. When it happened to Saul, Saul didn't seek God. Saul went to the medium. He, right. he, he, he called Cleo. He went to the palm reader. He went and got the, the daily reflector and read the horoscope. Because he was born in that month. and wanted to see what his horoscope said. But the difference between the response of Saul and David is, David talked to the one who was in control. God. God Lord, uh, shall I go get them? Watch this, watch this. Oh, I, I love this. I, I so love this. David had, David didn't say nothing about can I win. That wasn't even a question. The fact that he lost any ability to fight wasn't even a question. God, I just need to know, do you want me to go fight? Because if you want me to go fight, it's not going to be a fight. Y'all missed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord, shall I go after them? Uh, yeah. Pursue them. And, and not only uh, 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 are you going to pursue them, but some things going to happen. Stop being so concerned with the possibility of being stoned that you miss the promise of God's next steps. Well, well you know, I, I might not need to do that. You know, I don't know how they're going to react. Stop. Now watch this. They thought about stoning David, but you ain't see one rock fly. Lord have mercy. Don't let the thoughts stop you. They, 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 David heard the thoughts and that's where the enemy plays he said I'm seeking to and fro whom I may devour well I'm in your thoughts and, and if I can mess with your thoughts then I can mess with your next steps Lord who am I talking to in here are anybody afraid to take the next step because you've been thinking the wrong thoughts and God said I can fix your thoughts the thoughts you need to have are thoughts of peace and not of evil and understand that I will bring you to an expected end says Jeremiah 29 verse 11 tell somebody I said God will fix your thoughts yeah 
You're so concerned about the possibility of losing that you won't take next steps. <laughs> the reason why you hadn't bought a house is because Larry lost his. And Larry, your first cousin. And you're trying to buy a house the same side of town Larry was on. And Larry had a good job. And so basically because you're kin to Larry and don't want to live on the same side of Larry, and Larry made more money than you, 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 you don't even want to buy a house. You get to make, and ain't nothing happened to you. You're paying your bills on time. Got a little change in the bank. Your credit worthiness is continuing to climb. And because you're thinking about Larry. Larry ain't you. And I ain't Larry. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Why did I call this between rocks and recovery? It's a very interesting place. Now see, I like to hit people where they are. Everybody is going to find this place somewhere in their life. There's going to be a rocky place. And there's going to be a place for recovery. But if you're so concerned with the rocks, you will never find recovery. Amen? And the fool, the, I'm not there yet. Hold on for a minute, Slim. The foolish part is, is just because it's going good now, you think the rocky place won't show up. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Money is not the absolver of rocky places. You can be sitting there eating filet mignon with clarified butter on a lobster. Wanting to drive off the bridge when you leave the restaurant. Bishop. Hello? My you know what? I like black folks. I got most black folks in here. See, the reason why black folks think that's hard to believe because you never had it. And you think once you get it, you won't feel that way. See, we come from struggle. And so when I say examples like that, you think, oh, uncle, only thing you got to do is give me a little piece of money, bitch, and I'm going to be fine. You just get me a nice house, and I'm going to be fine. Let me tell you something, good black people. Your kids can wear $300 shoes. You can live in a $500,000 house. You can drive a $100,000 car. Let me tell you something. It don't stop arguments. While you sitting over there getting a massage in, 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 in the Maybach. He cussing you out while you driving. Or you want to cuss him out while you riding. And slamming them automatic closed doors. It don't stop attitudes. Hello? And I know, because you know why? We're in this flesh. And if we don't understand that rocks exist, we won't know recovery is possible. Because people will flip on you. Quick. And watch this. The worst flip is the unexpected flip. Now, I ain't talking about the ones you already see. Oh, yeah, right. No, uh -uh. I'm talking about the one. I love you. I'll never leave you. I'm with you. Oh my God, God brought us together. That flip. Hello? Tell somebody, Rocky Place. But if you ever get over the rocks, if you ever get over the rocks, it's par for the course. If you ever get over the rocks, there's only one thing left. Recovery. Watch this, watch this. He told David, pursue, and you shall surely overtake them, and without fail, recover what that last word say all oh, hold up you mean to tell me that while I was gone the enemy came in and messed up my house and took and just 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 ramshacked and just did all that he could do 
And now I inquire of God, and God said, don't you worry about it. Watch this. Some people just want to pray about when the enemy comes. But no, I got more, I got more to do than just pray. God didn't say pray. God said pray, and then what? Pursue, Lord. See, this is for y'all that just want to pray, and God going to fix it. Nope. Uh-uh. He said, God said, I'm not going to fix nothing that you can fight. Oh, once he, he prayed, he talked to God. And what did God say? Go. He prayed. He was a prayer warrior. He was an intercessor. He was on the intercessory team, David was. He prayed. And what did he do after that? Got up and went. He went to the Amalekites and slew them and got everybody back that was lost. Do y'all hear me? It's time to get off of your knees and go. It's time. God gonna fix it. You're right. You, and, and you the solution. He gonna fix it through you. Yeah, he gonna fix it through you. That's why we got to get off this gospel of just receiving. Bishop. This reception gospel. Just, re, just receive the word. And it's, it's, it's right. But watch this. God has a pattern that when he gives you his spirit, he sends you. Now hold on. Let me fix that. Let, let, me, let me fix that. Because someone might say, I got the spirit, so that's why I really need to do what I need to do, Bishop. Nope. God sends you. Come here, honey. You look so nice today. He sends you through somebody. So for those of you who had a dream last night and 72 angels sat around your bed and you heard the voice of God and you're the only one who heard it and you're the only one who saw the angels. Find a body. Yes, that's true. Yes. That can. Yes. Validate your experience yes. and make sure that you uh, got a Bible. Can I see a Bible? Can I see that? That's a nice. I know, Keith, you got the Bible. Yeah, yeah. I'm closing. You, you can play these right here. Find a Bible. I mean, hold on. Find a person. Credible, mature. Credible, mature. You need two things. To move on what God says. A body and a Bible. Y'all didn't catch what I just said, did you? I need a I need I need a spiritual person following the word of God that that's not my peer that I can submit to and listen to. And then, once I found that body, God does not give me a dream outside of the Bible. Your business plan is in here. And watch this. It's covered by an authority. You got it? Mm -hmm. So watch this. Patria has a dream. God gave her, God, God gave her, she, she saw the 72 angels around her bed. Now watch this. She, she reading the word, she said, but, but now she comes, okay, she has a pastor too. Yes. Pastor. Yes. This, this is what I believe the Lord is dealing with me on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is the foundational scripture that I believe he's coming from. Mm -hmm. Pastor, I don't want to make a move because I feel like I need to make a move. I'm here to consult your spiritual counsel. That's right. That's right. Can you share wisdom with me That's right. in this? And sometimes the pastor might say, you know what? It's probably a bit premature based on what you share. But I believe the time is right. X, Y, Z. We don't want to hear that. Because we believe when we have a dream and we get in the word, we need to go. There are so many people I wish that would have just listened.
And as a result, they never got out of the rocky place. Because let me tell you the trick to this. Thank you, honey. The trick to this is when you're between rocks and recovery, when you have accountability, the enemy will make you think that somebody's trying to hold you back. And I've told this story before. I just said, Lord, you got a baby look just like KJ. <laughs> I told this story before. But I remember, and Pastor Rhea asked me this question not too long ago. She said, do you ever regret not going preaching for that big church? Because my pastor told me no. He, he told me no at the weirdest time. A few hours before I was going to pre preach at the big church. But guess what? But guess what? This is what, this is what happened. Hallelujah. Hey, Amen. She'll be all right. But watch this. I ain't had nothing to say. It was a church about 400, 500 members or something. I, I wasn't even ordained. I was just a young minister that knew how to, how to do preside. Somebody gave me an invitation to go, and I was excited. I ain't had nothing to say. Nothing. And I think about it. So when she asked, did you regret? I said, nope. I said, because if I'd have stood up in front of them folks and said what I thought I needed to say, <laughs> I don't know where that would have led. But that was probably the wisest no I have ever accepted. Didn't feel good when I said accepted it. But I was, I was in between a rock and a hard place. Because guess what? I called, The guy called me. It was like almost 1 o'clock in the morning. And uh, he called me. And I, and I told him I couldn't come. But before I told him I couldn't come, I told my pastor. I said, what about my name? <laughs> Man, ain't nobody know me. Ain't no preach nowhere. I know we present. Everybody know me. Nobody know no, no Toby Danes. I wasn't even going by TCD. Nobody know me. But it was all about me. And God doesn't want you to recover just for you. David didn't even seek that just on behalf of himself. He saw the people hurting around him. He said, God, I need an answer for these men. They're hurting like I am. God, what can I do to help the people I serve? Go fight, David. And you're going to recover everything. Is that good? Center our feet.